All right, well, uh, everybody have a good morning. How many uh, did well in those negotiations? <laughs> Could have done better, did great. Um, and uh, I saw a lot of you engaged in the, the uh, mass spec demos. You guys like those too? Yeah, Mike and Graham worked really hard on those, and Angie and Trent, so I want to thank all them for their effort there. It was really fun. So we're going to try to stay on schedule here so that um, we can uh, give you enough time to get some food before we uh, do our social event. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Andy Tao. Um, so Andy was a student of Graham Cook's. If you don't know about Graham Cook's, uh, one of the, one of the um, founders of our field. And um, uh, Andy did a postdoc at the Institute for Systems Biology with Lee Hood and Rudy Abersall and uh, sort of really embraced the systems biology concept and mass spectrometry very early and uh, in his lab now at Purdue where he's been, uh, I think, for almost 13 years. Yeah. Uh, he's focused on systems biology, omics applications of mass spectrometry and really led the field in PTM analysis. I remember. I don't know, it seems like a couple years ago, but it was probably eight, where he and I organized a, a phosphoproteomics tutorial thing through ASMS in, in Boston. It was a lot of fun. Um, and so uh, without further ado, Andy Tao. Let me see. You guys hear me? Yes. So, yeah, as a, thank you, Josh. Uh, I think it's 2012. Yeah, and uh, so we co organized an uh, ASMS workshop. So it's, I believe it's two days, right? Two days workshop on one single PTM, which is a false relation. So you now he asked me to do P total PTM in 30 minutes. So I guess. <laughs> so. Uh, let me move to the next slide. And so, so I want to try to, not to talk too much, of it. I do have these uh, outlines, but so consider the audience and uh, so probably uh, instead of talking about different PTMs, I will pretty much look at the bigger picture of PTMs and uh, see, uh, I, I understand the audience also, probably some of you guys are relatively new to the field. And some of you guys are probably really experts, so it's hard to uh, really choose uh, how to uh, talk about the PTMs. So I hope uh, more on the big pictures, the discussions, to see what exact challenges in this field. And so I try not to get into technical details. Instead, let's look at uh, see the uh, importance of the PTMs and uh, see how we try to solve these issues in PTM. So basically, I will talk a little bit uh, on the importance of PTMs and what's the current strategies. And then I give a case study on phosphorylation, but because the I don't want to separate the phosphorylation because more or less kind of uh, case based, so I will basically embed the phosphorylation into all these field. And hopefully I, I give you a little bit uh, of flavors on, on each subject. All right, so uh, PTM, is, I, so I probably don't need to talk about this slide, but I think it's worth the discussion. Uh, so from this slide that uh, I want to mention that the PTM certainly is uh, much more complex compared to genomics uh, and also transcriptomes. And the, the reason is that uh, <coughs> every protein's function, so if you think about the protein's functions and the PTM is involved, and uh, so the reason behind that is uh, protein does not act alone. So it has to uh, interact with something, okay, another molecule. For example, if it is an enzyme, so it, sometimes it has a core enzyme, but it has to act on the substrate, all right? And then, uh, so this is one thing. Another, so if it's a receptor, it has to interact with, with a ligand. So all these different situations, so protein, uh, has to interact with a molecule. So that interaction uh, is certainly is a non-covalent interaction. So this interaction related to protein's property. That property is hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, ionic interactions. And if you disrupt that interaction, and when is your, if you uh, certainly modify the uh, proteins, uh, in this case, covalent modification, 
uh, in cells. So that is PTM. So that's, you can tell that almost you can name every type of uh, protein uh, functions uh, PTM is involved. And so that's, uh, I list uh, some of them, but uh, I'm just go ahead and use uh, some of protein phosphation as a, a as an example to look at some functions. All right, so uh, related to the mass spec, so I would like to uh, point out several characteristics of uh, PTMs. So number one, it is a covalent modification. Uh, even if it's a covalent modification, but different PTMs tend to have uh, some of lay by, some is not lay by. Uh, so some of the reverse, uh, most of the reverse, but some of them are not reverse. So <coughs> If it's rever reversible, so there's typically involve multiple enzymes uh, in it. And so these days, uh, especially we discover these new modifications. And when you discover new modifications, uh, always uh, if you send, try to send to a good journal, they always ask you what is, what is the, en the enzyme involved so that you have to identify these enzymes uh, with the PTM. And then the PTM is very dynamic, so it is a, a trouble, so how you prepare the samples, so the, the you choose a certain time point, you may not get uh, exact the PTM you're looking for, and so that's the important part. And the specific part is also is a problem, for example, protein phosphorylation. If you do know very good specificity, you can today, you can use motive assay, you can use certain biology, and try to basically uh, predict, but uh, unfortunately, a lot of PTMs, they don't have exactly kind of specificity you're looking for. There are some specificity, but, uh, but not uh, as specific as you, you really expect. So that's also cause a problem. And then uh, certainly the shift in the mass spec, uh, that's the uh, merit for, the f for us to develop a mass spec based uh, approach. And the last one is the uh, how lay by this one is uh, PTM based, uh, individual PTMs, some are quite stable, which is uh, for mass spec analysis certainly is very nice, but uh, for a lot of them are enzymatically lay by, so which means you need to add an inhibitor and we need to do either uh, in vivo and also in vitro treatment. And the second one is chemically lay by. Chemically lay by sometimes uh, when you do in vitro sample preparation, so the PTM side pretty much get lost. And so in that case, certainly you will not see them uh, when you're using mass spec, but it doesn't mean they are not there. So that's the issue for some of these PTMs. Uh, and then uh, the last part is mass spectrometry also lay by. So for example, uh, protein phosphorylation, so the phosphor phosphor phosphate site uh, basically, if you fragment the phosphopeptide, you tend to lose it very quickly. Uh, and that uh, will affect the overall identification with that phosphopeptide. So all these characteristics, some are uh, really uh, good feature for us to apply mass spec based method. But for a lot of them are actually uh, increase the challenges for us to develop a mass spec based uh, approach. All right. so. I want, would like to use the phosphorylation as an example to, to look at the uh, PTM. So in this case, uh, protein phosphorylation is uh, reversible. If it's reversible, it involves two enzymes. One is kinase, one is phosphatase. Okay, so these two. So that in that case, <coughs> kinase would add a phosphate group onto it, and then the phosphatase would remove a phosphate group. And so that that uh, lead to a lot of function changes uh, in the protein. So that is first one, enzyme activity. Uh, so some, some enzymes, once you add a phosphate group, uh, you activate the phosph pretty much the enzyme. But uh, once you remove it, you actually um, pretty much deactivate the enzyme, number one. And so some, the most important part for phosphate group is that you uh, change potentially the conformation of the protein. And uh, that's uh, leading to the overall changes in functions. <coughs> and so, and a lot of actually protein phosphorylation related to the localization of its protein. And uh, once you add the phosphate group and the protein can penetrate uh, uh, 
and the membrane and go into the nucleus. And uh, once you remove it and, uh, and they get out, so that's the related uh, location. And uh, the one I mentioned uh, uh, quite a bit is related protein-protein interactions. And uh, these interaction typically is hydrophobic, uh, hydrophilic, all these interaction together. And you add a phosphate group uh, or you direct uh, impact the site of um, interaction or you change the conformation of the protein and leading to the overall change in protein, protein interaction. So that is also uh, the reason. Okay, so all these things are basically uh, related to the protein phosphorylation. And uh, I don't want to give other example on the other PTMs and uh, uh, so we don't exactly know. At least I don't know why phosphorylation not methylation or others, others as choosing, uh, chosen for the particular cell signaling, let's say. Uh, so, but they need to have one type of PTM, at least for signal signaling. Uh, and nobody, I think nobody really addressed the origin of the protein phosphorylation as a source for signaling, but it certainly is one of the most important PTMs. All right, so now we know that is and the protein phosphorylation has a lot of <coughs> um, function related. And now let's look at the, in terms of challenges when we, we try to analyze protein phosphorylation by mass spec. Okay, number one is uh, I mentioned that, uh, so there are a lot of kinases in, in cells, so using human cell as an example, over 500 uh, um, protein kinase involved uh, and plus other kinases. So these are each kinase may or may not have specificity. Uh, so that's uh, increase the overall the complexity um, of protein phosphorylation. Number one. Uh, so that's uh, it is extremely difficult to predict uh, whether this side is phosphate or not. Number one. And uh, and the second one is uh, once you try to do certain type of analysis, for example, uh, since this is related to the protein uh, molecule interaction, can you use a pull-down method or something like that to look at it? Uh, unfortunately, uh, for example, protein phosphorylation is difficult uh, using that method because uh, the interaction between kinase and the substrate actually is relatively weak, and if you use the IP-based method, and you may not be able to exactly look at the substrate and then look at the phosphorylation. So all these factors uh, can make it phosphorylation are difficult. All right. So, uh, so after Josh gave me this task to look at the PTM, so I actually originally gave, with the help of my students, I tried to summarize all the new PTM of the past 10 years. And uh, actually, I had a a bigger table of it, but I turned out, I, I think, it's difficult to put uh, on the slides. So it actually, if you guys are interested, I can send you that list uh, by me and a student working together. So, so now these days, uh, there are many uh, PTMs, and uh, at least 20 of them are relatively well studied. And so here's showing a sort of old table by Matthias Mann, and the review in the Nature Biotech now more than 10 years ago. So here's showing some of the uh, these PTMs and uh, its functions and related to the uh, mass changes and which you can look at it. At that time, is I believe the high resolution mass spec is still uh, a new part, so they didn't particularly write on the uh, decimal points, but certainly these days you can use that decimal points as an advantage to look at these uh, mass changes uh, on this side. <coughs> All right, so, so I, as I mentioned, I don't go into uh, the specifics of each PTM, so, but I would like to, to um, basically look at the general strategy to, uh, to analyze PTMs, okay. And the first one is that uh, is certainly it's easy, so you can look at the mass shift. That's, the, I think, uh, early days how we look at it. Sometimes uh, I believe some of the new uh, PTM changes early days purely based on the accident, and then you look at the shift on the mass back, and then you find that uh, that's new modifications. Uh, so that's uh, very nice. It, and uh, but before that is in order to look at a certain uh, 
uh, PTM such as protein phosphorylation, you have to use some methods such as radio isotope and the mass spec is very convenient and you don't need to use this method. You, you look at the mass changes. So that's the absolute advantage for uh, using mass spec to do the PTM analysis. So that's the second one. And the third part is, uh, is the difficult part. And uh, this part is basically we can claim that the mass spec does not rely on um, PTM specific antibodies. And so that's, uh, we, we know that antibodies still are widely used for PTM analysis, and, the, and but it comes with a baggage. Number one is particular for PTMs. Uh, for example, we can use the protein frustration as an example. Uh, there are some of what you call the phosphor pan antibodies, so you can look at all the serine straining or tyrosine antibodies, but unfortunately, except the tyrosine phosphopeptides, uh, you can use the antibody, but serine straining are usually difficult, uh, usually the specificity is very poor. And then, if you look at a really specific antibody, but they really look at the phosphorylation sites, and uh, that can be quite a challenge because there are so many different phosphorylation sites, and uh, every day, I think a lot of groups are discovering new phosphorylation sites. Now, some may or may not be important, but in order to prove that's important, you need to get an antibody. And that antibody costs at least $500 and uh, wait for three months in order to get the one first. And sometimes it comes with extreme poor quality. And then if you order another batch, sometimes they don't get this kind of quality uh, anymore. So that's uh, extremely. Uh, I mean, antibody, regular antibody, we already have a trouble. And then these uh, PTM specific antibody, even more trouble. So that's, I think, is extremely uh, challenging. But hopefully, mass spec eventually will ad address this issue. All right. So, and the, compared to the other traditional biochemistry method, and I think sequence by tandem mass spec certainly is the most sensitive and, uh, and fast. And we can claim that uh, overall is high throughput. I think these days, uh, identification of 10,000, 20,000 phosphorylation sites uh, in a few hours now is considered in a lot of mass spec lab is considered as a routine work. Uh, and for some of other uh, PTMs, uh, certainly, uh, it depending on the uh, how available some of these uh, masses to analyze, but uh, mass spec overall can do quite a good job compared to the uh, other uh, traditional uh, approaches. All right, so, so what is the general strategy? So, so as we understand, that there are typically two approaches for the mass spec identification on proteins. One is top down, and one is bottom up. And that for the, in some degree, is kind of similar for the top down. I think there are very specific application and advantages for top down. Uh, proteomics and, uh, and the protein identification, and the phone number of such as uh, histone modifications, and certainly very nice. But overall, top down is still evolving, and the current is still limited to small proteins. And uh, then um, you very much needed to enrich the individual protein. In this case, is PTM modified uh, proteins you need. And then um, for the top downs, you need an ECD. Uh, for the fragmentation in order to get uh, extensive frag fragmentation. And uh, the advantage for the top down is that you look at the protein and you look at the several PTM modification at the same time in the one single protein, which give you the exact information. Uh, you need uh, several PTM in order to work together in certain biological event. But for bottom up, in the case we break them into pieces, you don't exactly know whether these two PTMs exactly happening. So that's the advantage for top down. So for the bottom up, uh, the procedures today is ready to mature. So uh, usually you need uh, to enrich uh, the PTM peptides, but not the proteins. Because even if you enrich the proteins, in order to get the side of modification, you still need modif you need to get uh, enrich these uh, modified uh, uh, peptides. So th these days, uh, we typically go ahead and digest into 
um, peptide, and then you just enrich the PTM peptides uh, as a first step. And then um, there are certainly, <coughs> when you do mass spec data acquisition, there are certain uh, different type of uh, activation, and this is for individual PTMs, there could be issues. For some of them are uh, usually fine, but for certain modifications such as phosphorylation, uh, it's uh, quite a challenge, and you need a different type of um, activation. So we see this actually consider common ones, CID, HCD, and ETD for phosphorylation is uh, particularly uh, would it be good to use uh, several methods together? And I will give you guys uh, examples uh, to do that. And then, of course, these are the procedures to get the data. And uh, I have time, we'll talk about the software to analyze um, all these PTMs. But I understand Alex may also be able to talk about this PT PTM identification and look at the side of PTMs. And these are also important issues. Uh, in the PTM analysis. All right, so, so since bottom up is considered a standard procedure, so I will basically focus on the, focus on the uh, uh, PTM uh, in bottom up approach. So number one is sometimes you work with others, uh, with other biological groups, and they believe this sample. Uh, is phosphorylated or glycosylated or, or PTM modified, and the number one is uh, sample progression. Okay, so number one question is: uh, Do you want to enrich or you don't need to enrich? Because it comes with uh, both good and bad things. So it depends on how complex your sample. So if your sample is relatively simple, purified complex, and in that case you may not need enrichment. Uh, so because any enrichment uh, always leads to sample loss. That's uh, you add extra steps, and you add extra uncertainties. So that's uh, if you can avoid uh, enrichment, uh, certainly is a good part. But if your sample is complex, you have many proteins inside, and then enrichment uh, is necessary. For PTMs, because most of the time, PTM is only a fraction of your total sample. So that enrichment become necessary for a complex sample. So that's one part. And the second part is also depending on the modifications, all right? Uh, for some modifications, we simply don't have a variable method for enrichment. And uh, some of the new, relative new modifications, you don't have uh, a way to uh, enrich, and uh, so you certainly have to stay with the samples. You, in the case, what do you need to do? You probably need to do fractionation, so you get a multiple fractions in order to get the uh, certain PTMs. Otherwise, you only look at these unmodified peptides. You don't get the PTM peptides. And then also, what kind of machine are available? And if your machine is a relatively slow, slow machine, and not a very sensitive machine, and then you probably definitely need uh, some sort of uh, uh, enrichment. And if your machine is very fast, very sensitive, so you could avoid that uh, uh, enrichment by extensive look at the data, and then you'll be able to get it. So these are the decisions when you discuss with uh, on this project. So that project maybe uh, you need to reach uh, enrichment. But overall, if you have a complex sample, I think these days uh, enrichment is uh, typically is necessary. <coughs> All right, so, so now comes into how we're going to enrich these uh, PTM peptides. And so, so there are certainly multiple ways to enrich peptides depending on the uh, individual PTM. So the first one is uh, I talk about the affinity-based enrichment. So for the affinity-based enrichment, as one is uh, side specific, and th in this case is certainly you have antibody which recognizes PTM site, so that's very relatively straightforward. But that's certainly not easy to come by. Uh, 
And uh, so only for some well-studied uh, certain proteins or certain sites you want to ver verify certain sites you can get. And the second part, uh, especially for these high throughput proteomics like my group, uh, just group, so we look at the uh, lot of PTMs. In that case, you would like to pull out all the certain type of PTM. In this case, you would like to use called PTM motive antibody. And so in that case, uh, some companies such as uh, from the cell signaling technology, so they develop this called a PTM scan technology. So they develop these antibodies, uh, what can pull out a, a one type of these uh, PTMs, such as methylate, methylated peptides and also the uh, acetylated peptides, some of them are tend to be quite uh, effective. You don't get 100% of selectivity. Uh, I would say typically between 10% to 50% are considered uh, reasonable uh, selectivity because it's based on the peptide uh, enrichment. But I think uh, with kind of uh, and today's um, high resolution mass spec combined with this, uh, this enrichment, I think it's uh, overall it's good enough for you uh, to get a good identification. So that is uh, certainly today for uh, some of these uh, enrichment is, uh, is acceptable. Okay. And then for some of the specific types such as phosphorylation and the metal ion affinity purification, uh, Consider now these days are relatively cheap and uh, compared to antibodies and also very much uh, reproducible. Uh, and so, if you can stay away from the antibody, if you can develop uh, these uh, chemical based, usually is certainly uh, very nice. And, and the glycosylation, sometimes also you can use metal ion affinity as well. And then the glyco based, certainly the uh, lactin based is uh, considered more uh, dominant, but lactin uh, the specificity sometimes is not as high as we expected. So this, uh, this is the affinity based. All right, so the second way is chem uh, chemical reaction based. So chemical reaction based is, uh, number one is, uh, so you can develop this certain uh, chemistry uh, on the PTM. In that case, you can use a reaction to introduce that. So these days, uh, for the past 10 years, there are a lot of these new PTM sites. You can introduce a reaction group either to replace specifically the PTM site or you add a tag on the PTM site, then you can use uh, the enrichment to, to port that. So this is one. The second one is that you can pretty much in, introduce that group onto the PTM site in living cells. So in that case, uh, you'll be able to isolate them. So the, the one example is for glycosylation or for lipid modification. You can introduce the, these uh, azide beads uh, or, or azide group or akim using the clicker chemistry. So you can, you can do that uh, in living cells so you can get the modification. So these are all the chemical based. Uh, to do that, okay. And the third part is uh, some of these modifications are extremely lay biased. So if you just let it go to in vitro, they get lost. So in that case, you have to use chemistry in order to preserve these PTM sites. So these are the absolutely necessary. You have to develop the, the kind of chemistry in order to enrich PTMs. So this is the one. The last part is uh, it, it depends on the method of choice. For example, for glycosylation, uh, especially in glycosylation, early days, if you uh, isolate the, these uh, glyco containing uh, these uh, glycopeptides, you don't have the ability to identify them because the glycoside is too big, so you have to use the enzyme to cut them off, okay? And the s then if you do solid phase based uh, enrichment, then you can uh, bas basically using this method to uh, release these specific uh, PTM peptides, although they don't have the PTM side anymore, but uh, you you be able to enrich them. So that's the enzyme based uh, method to you can do enrichments. And, uh, Last part is uh, you can do the chromatography based uh, some enrichment method. Some, some of them are certainly chromatography is not uh, exactly specific, but for certain cases, for example, uh, it's well known is the helic, uh, is the LC method. Uh, if you 
use them to enrich this glycosylate peptide, actually you get a quite a good selectivity. And uh, I think uh, Steve's lab also introduced this uh, SCX-based method. You can sort of pre-enrich these phosphopeptides um, before you really do uh, another enrichment uh, for much higher specificity. Okay. All right, so I try to give you one example again with uh, uh, phosphopeptide enrichment. So in that case, is if you use uh, antibody based for phosphopeptide, uh, you can use uh, certainly you can use the SH2 domain containing. Uh, so you recognize the SH2 domain in these uh, <coughs> phosphoproteins. All right, and then you. Uh, 14 three, three domains in that case uh, based on the property of these uh, phosphatase and so that's the one and the uh, third one is you can use phosphatase trapping uh, kind of best method also you can enrich the phosphoproteins so that's uh, considered uh, for some of the cases you want to look at the phosphoproteins instead of peptides that's uh, there are some methods available and then in terms of using the antibody uh, enrichment for phosphopeptides so far the, the good one is based based on the peptide of on the tyrosine phosphorylation so that uh, has been uh, widely practiced i think the specificity uh, is quite good but not for serine straining so for serine straining is typically using metal ion affinity, uh, so using the IMAC titanium dioxide, and my lab developed uh, so-called polymac, as so I indicated here, and so it's pretty much uh, more or less similar to uh, other approach, you have the metal on the polymer, and then you first enrich it uh, in the solution, and then we use the magnetic beads to pull them out, uh, uh, out of the solution. Uh, for mass spec analysis. So, so these are uh, the current, uh, I think, um, phosphopeptide enrichment uh, is considered these days have become quite uh, quite mature and you can get uh, uh, at least uh, over 80 percent of peptides are, are enriched. All right. All right, let me move fast. Uh, saying how are we going to do mass spec analysis? So mass spec analysis, uh, as I mentioned, uh, is PTM specific. For some of these PTMs, such as methylated uh, acetylation and methylation, once you'll be able to enrich them, um, PTM um, mass spec analysis is just like other uh, unmodified peptides, pretty easy. So there's uh, no uh, new things. But for certain PTM um, peptides, such as protein uh, phosphorylation, uh, it presents uh, some other challenges. So, so here's uh, I try to show you the example of this particular peptide on the top, which is unmodified, and then on the um, bottom part is that is uh, modified. So you, number one information you can get is that these two spectrum become extremely different, right? And because of the PTM uh, modification, so that's the PTM uh, with or without change, you can dramatically change the fragmentations in the mass spec. So that's uh, you want to keep in mind, okay? Uh, the second part is uh, you sometimes you try to early days you want to see especially on moldy based you want to look at the modified and unmodified and whether you'll be able to uh, really nail down the PTM. Unfortunately sometimes once you modify the PTM site uh, you have the PTM say don't elute at the similar time sometimes at least a few minutes apart. If you need plus, uh, you have a lot of peptides actually uh, involved, so you really cannot nail down base based on its retention time. So that's also the challenge part, all right? And then for PTM, is uh, uh, in Josh's group actually demonstrated that you can use uh, ETD or other approaches, so you'll be able to uh, get a better sequencing uh, for the sequencing. So you can look at it, here's the situation. Okay, so you can see that uh, in, this spectrum, you can see dominated peak. So that dominated peak is due to the loss of phosphoric acid, minus 98, which is very nice. You can see that, oh, it's a phosphopeptide. And the unfortunate part is that you have all the collision energy going to lose this one. So you don't have a lot of energy left to, for the backbone uh, fragmentation so that you don't get a sequence information. So that's, uh, so you want to avoid that. So ETD in some degree allow you to look at the backbone fragmentation so that give you the sequence information that help you to get the sequence information of phosphopeptides. Okay. 
Okay, so this one. This, and the second piece of information from these two spectrum is that, uh, so if you look at this one, at least you can see uh, two serines, and you can see either this side or another side can be force rated. Okay, in that case, you have to get, so, so from the original spectrum you can see, and uh, mainly we see the y, uh, y ions, okay, so I mean if we have advanced knowledge, and I don't really get detail why you mainly see the Y ions, but let's see that you mainly see the Y ions. So if we continue with this thread, if you want to differentiate this phosphorylation side uh, versus that phosphorylation side, you have to have see the fragment between them, okay? So in the case of S9 and S11, so you, you have to have either Y9 or Y10 ions in order to differentiate the site modification. Otherwise, so you cannot differentiate these sites. So in that case, you will not consider um, truly get the PTM sites. All right, so the second uh, <coughs> Example I would like to give to you is that uh, so you can uh, using these uh, different uh, analytical method in the mass spec you look at the different modifications in the case is intact glycopeptides so these days uh, consider as uh, important feature of these days that you don't need to use enzyme to cut off the glycoside you can analyze the glyco portion and the peptide portion at the same time. So in that case, so you can use the CID fragmentation and you can get the uh, <coughs> glyco chain uh, on the top and then on the bottom part you can use the ETD and in that case um, mainly you can look at the all the fragment uh, ions from the backbones so then you can get the information of both glyco uh, and also uh, the peptide sequence information. All right, so let me move quickly. And uh, so for the fourth peptide, there are a lot of other signatures that I don't get in details. So that's as we work out the early days and the fourth peptide, you'll be able to using specific mass back, a specific acquisition to look at the fossil peptides. And these also uh, work for some of the other modification. All right, so now the last part of it, uh, I try to get the identification for, uh, for these uh, uh, fossil peptides and also other PTMs. And uh, they are so much more difficult. So I list here as a lot of difficult part. And the mainly, mainly is due to the fact is that uh, you have a lot of potential uh, unmodified peptide may be still in your sample if you don't do the enrichment, so you have to do it. And the second part uh, mainly is due to the fact is that you are, look at a PTM, you basically look at the potential modifications, so it's uh, variable modifications. So here's the example, if you don't look at a modification, you only have one peptide in the database, and then if you single modification, suddenly you have four peptides in the database you look at, and you need two that suddenly increase more. So you are increase uh, the basic library to search for uh, exponentially, uh, especially you look at the m multiple modification in, in, in each peptide. So this is particular uh, troublesome for protein phosphorylation. In one peptide you can have a three, four, or five size can be modified, and then you increase the database size quite a bit, and then you uh, leading you a uh, bigger trouble in terms of uh, machine time. And when it was that time in Ludi's lab, we uh, search uh, um, uh, basically, um, for the proteomics, it took five days to get the, the, the results back because it took forever uh, for, for database search. But today is much better, but still a, a big challenge. All right, so, so here's the part to say look at the, uh, in terms of software for identification, okay? And these days for a um, majority of PTMs, you can use these standard uh, database search. You'll be able to uh, nail down these PTM and so here's uh, I show you some Max Quang or Sequest Bionica, and, and these are able to look at the mass shift as long as they are known uh, PTM sites. So allow you to uh, to use standard method, and then there are 
quite a few methods available to look at the side of modifications. So you have to turn on the functions to look at these site, which means you say look at it specifically, for example, um, between these residues in order to nail down exact site. So phosphor ice and uh, luciferous. So these are methods certainly and software available to look at the side of modification, give you a probability on one particular PTM size. So these are the uh, important. The the last one is also for the PTMs because sometimes one protein you only get one peptide. Okay, how can you do the quantification, especially some label-free quantification? So these are I don't have time to go into details, but some softwares, especially on skylines, allow you to basically address these issues, and there are a lot of softwares that actually can go into it. And the last part is maybe two minutes. Well, two minutes I talk about uh, these uh, extreme challenges. Uh, so if you want to look at uh, these uh, PTM, uh, unknown PTM, how can you do it? And uh, so these are the ones certainly bring a lot of challenges. I use the basically the one big diagram showing that. So this is uh, reviewed actually in the mass spec review, uh, actually 2016. Uh, so if you don't know PTM, how can you looking for the unknown PTMs? So uh, this one is uh, typically put a lot of efforts uh, on the computational work, uh, and because the, your database is just uh, too big and the library is too big to handle. So the, the main part of all these ones is try to uh, minimize the database. Uh, so there are several ways to minimize the database, and so you can pre-search first. Uh, you reduce the base database, and uh, and uh, that's one way. The second way is using some of these called uh, uh, sequence tag, and you first get the unmodified version of the peptide, and so you know what exactly this peptide is, or part of these peptides, and in order to narrow down the uh, the overall the library size, okay, and uh, some of these methods in order to achieve this unrestricted or this unknown PTM, so you need to have a pair of these um, peptides modified or unmodified, and then you be able to look at the mass shift. So in that case, there are certain softwares align these and also spectrum to can compare. So this is actually uh, um, quite a nice review. Look at for you to look at uh, all these PTM. Uh, especially unknown PTMs, but uh, you typically don't expect using this method to get a lot of unknown or, or larger for them. So usually you get maybe one or two novel PTMs, which is good enough for you to move forward. Then you can focus on that PTMs. All right. So uh, I think I learned from Alex. I don't have the time, but I just uh, indicate to my group. So my group uh, is. Uh, hey. Ooh -ooh. <laughs> See, uh, one of my students uh, named my lab called Pretomics. And uh, so my lab is the work uh, introduces we have uh, two projects at least uh, to work on these PTMs. And one uh, is we look at the phosphoproteomics involved in cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and also in plants. So we actually look at uh, quite a bit of in the plant uh, uh, phosphoproteomics. Uh, so these are considered fundamental uh, phosphoproteomics. And then we later on actually moved into clinical a bit. Uh, so we look at the PTM proteins in the in extracellular vesicles. And we believe uh, this is actually the rich source for us to relate to the and relate these PTMs with the diseases. I believe I my lab is feel pretty excited into these directions. And then we have a, a one small uh, sort of group is working on the chemical proteomics uh, and uh, also. All right. Okay. Thank you, guys. <coughs> Let's take a question or two before we uh, break. Questions? Anything? Okay, yeah. Uh, for the phosphatidosine peptides, what's the best alternative way to enrich them without uh, antibodies? So, okay, sorry, can you say it again? So, okay. Phospho. For phospho, what's the best way to do it without an antibody? 
Yeah. Without the antibody. Okay. So, so as I mentioned, if your sample is complex, so you, these days you always need to use the uh, enrichment method. And if it's a tyrosine infiltration, I think it's uh, these days you you use the antibody based. Antibody. Yeah. But otherwise, you get all the serine straining because tyrosine is only like less than one percent or zero point one percent to get that. And then for serine straining phosphorylation, these days titanium dioxide or these IMAC method are quite, uh, uh, I would say, quite uh, uh, routine. Or these days, you can get over ninety percent of full specificity. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah. Got one more over here. <laughs> hey, Andy. Very, very nice talk. Um, for your example of that uh, Y11 ion, I notice uh, the intensity is really, really low. Do you suggest we look at a signal to noise ratio more than three just to make sure that's a confident Y11? <laughs> so, so, you, so your question is that probably I will let's not look at, it, otherwise we're wasting everybody's time, right? So, so you are, you're talking about the potential uh, you you look at the fragmentation, so, the, so sometimes it's just a signal noise ratio is too low to to really give you kind of information. But I think in the MS, MS usually, as long as you see them, because noise level is usually low. So for so as long as you are reasonably get a signal noise, signal noise ratio, let's say over two or three, uh, I consider a reliable. But in the MS stage, certainly this kind of signal noise ratio could be trouble, uh, maybe false positive. But in MS, MS, the noise level is usually quite low. I think w once you see that, uh, usually consider is a positive indication uh, as, as a fragment between, because you really need that information in order to nail down the, the basic side. I, I don't know whether I uh, answer your question. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thank you. OK, so just some logistics before we, we depart. Um, a great day. Uh, so uh, just want to let everybody know that um, we have the social event this afternoon. Um, if you uh, would like to come with us to the state park, we would love to have you. Um, you will remember in your folder, and I've emailed this, there's a waiver. The university requires me to get one from you. Um, before you get on the bus. So this will be your bus ticket. So, uh, and they're gonna have three buses and they're gonna pick us up. There's a side street right over here called Orchard. And the buses will be parked there and they're gonna pull out of here at 1.30. So they'd like you to load before that. <laughs> and they're gonna be numbered one, two, and three. You decided you, if you would like to do the rock climbing activity today, then you need to get on the bus number three because it's going to park in a different place in the park when we get there. If you would like to hike or kayak or just kind of hang out, then you can get on bus number one or two. I'd like you to write your, so you sign here, but if you could print your name, that would be good because the most important thing to me is that um, every bus that goes with people comes back with the same number of people. So I don't want to leave anybody there. So. What we're going to do is, if you ride bus number one to the park, I would like you to get back on bus number one at the end. And we're going to collect all these, and we're going to do a roll call, so we're not leaving until we have everybody. <laughs> so know everybody around you, and make sure you remind them, like, I'd like to get home too, so please get back on this bus. Um, that would be really helpful. So uh, finally, I just want to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific and Promega for sponsoring our event. So uh, we'll serve you dinner up there. And uh, I'd like to get cut you loose so that you can get lunch beforehand. So um, buses pull out at 1.30. If you're going rock climbing, get on bus number three. This signed waiver will be your ticket to get on the bus, write your name, and get back on the bus that you got off of when you get there. All right, we'll see you there. Have a great day.